presenting, so to speak, tonight on Harold and Shirley's behalf is Beth Kobliner, their daughter. Um, Beth, welcome to uh, our virtual bookstore. Thank you, Don. It's great to be here. I wish I could be there in person, but this is the next best thing. That's right. And we'll certainly have you back uh, when conditions are, are safe to do so. Um, we definitely miss uh, the intimacy of our in-person events, but we're so happy to connect with our community this way. Um, but let's get into it. So to start with the obvious, um, this isn't a book by you, but by you are an author yourself, but this is a book by your parents. Also, I have the book right here so people can see just how beautiful it is. Uh, I also really love the inner flap with all the notes. Um, tell us a bit about Harold and Shirley and, and how this book came to be. Well, thank you again, John. You've been great. And I uh, feel lucky to be speaking um, here. Um, so the book was written by my parents, Harold and Shirley Kobliner. Um, and it was just came out, it was published by Simon and Schuster. Uh, I guess the first thing to know about my parents is that they were happily married for 65 years. Um, my father had a PhD in education and his whole thing was speaking up for underserved communities. Uh, when he was in the army, he created a program for soldiers to get their high school diplomas um, at a time when that became a requirement um, and a lot of them wouldn't be able to stick with their career otherwise. He introduced art and music uh, for the first time to special education classes in junior high schools and he became, became a New York City model. Um, and he was chairman of the board of examiners. He was a real advocate for students and making sure teachers are trained in the subjects that they're teaching. My mom was a chemistry major, which was unusual for her day. Um, but also an excellent writer and uh, a real person who just enjoyed life to its fullest. Um, so the book stemmed from their love of each other and a love of language. Um, and uh, they both love the idea that everyone has expressions that they grew up with um, and that the, there's great joy in sharing them. And we can learn a lot from each other and everybody has something to offer. Uh, both of my parents, they were born in 1929, the beginning of the Depression, and my father's family was extraordinarily poor. Um, so when he decided he wanted to go on and be a teacher, before he took any exams, he read the entire dictionary because he felt he really needed that cultural enrichment uh, from something, and he wanted to have a really good vocabulary. Um, and he also was a very hard worker in that uh, he had a bunch of part-time jobs. While he was a principal, he taught the English portion of the SATs in our basement. So I just remember that growing up in the 1970s where all these cool teenagers would be coming in. Um, and uh, so the basic point of the book and the, the idea for writing it came from they were speaking to my son's kindergarten class. Um, this is a while ago. Um, and uh, they were supposed to read a book to the class. And as my mom started reading the book, all the little kids started to squirm. And uh, my mother said, hey, she closed the book and she was a great teacher. And she said, you guys have ants in your pants. And they're like, ants in your pants? I mean, they didn't know what it meant. And my dad said, well, let's think of other insect expressions. So there was, you know, one kid said busy as a bee and they talked about social butterfly and snug as a bug in a rug. Um, and my parents who were lifelong educators felt that it was so much fun and the kids got so much out of it on the drive home. They said, we should write a book of expressions for people of all ages. And they spent the next 13 years <laughs> jotting down expressions from everyday life. So what sort of started as a hobby or a lark ended up being, uh, so to speak, the book that you showed, uh, which is the world's largest collection of expressions of its kind. Well, as you can see too, I already mentioned it as a thing about the book that I love and the inner flap of the book you get, I don't know if people can see it over the presentation, but there's lo looks like your parents' actual handwritten notes of these, yeah, of these expressions in these categories. So as they're compiling it, can you talk a bit more about the process in, in writing this book that I'm, that I'm holding up today? Right. Well, they started it when they were in their 70s. 
Mm-hmm. So uh, they were very young, active 70s. Uh, here they are. I think they're in their early 80s in this picture. They look damn good. Uh, <laughs> um, and they decided that they wanted to, uh, instead of, you know, they would practice what they called the art of listening. Um, they would write down an expression every time they came across one in everyday life whether it was on the radio, uh, reading a book, uh, on TV, during a debate or or newscast, um, in the theater, we're from New York and they would go to the theater a lot, or just even from people, friends or acquaintances, the guy at the grocery store, the woman at the optician store, they had glasses. So whatever it was, they would write down expression when they came across it. Um, And once they had a hundred or so expressions, they would sit together and categorize them. And they would, um, so if, for example, they had somebody said fast as a rabbit, hungry as a lion, they would put that in animals. And then if busy as the bee, busy as a bee came along, they'd say, well, they started putting that in animals, but then animals got too big. So they changed it to bats, birds, and insects, things with wings. And over time, they kept doing this and doing this until they ended up with uh, 67 categories. Um, And what was funny, and the thing that you noticed is um, when you open the front flap, like you showed, um, uh, they would write all the expressions down. And what they did was my mom, being that she was born in 1929, was very careful and frugal and a real like recycler before that was even a thing. (laughs) Um, And so I don't know if you've ever sent a shirt to the dry cleaner, but if you need to get it back and you ask for it to be folded, it comes with some nice cardboard. So my mom saved those cardboards over the, you know, you know, almost three quarters of a century <laughs> they were together. And then um, uh, we, because she felt like, why would you, oh, here's a good picture of them. Why oh. would you throw away great scrap paper? Yeah. Um, and then they use those to organize the expressions. Um, and so I have about a hundred of those um, and they would, you know, write it down. And it's all my dad's handwriting. And I love it because you see cross outs and, you know, there's the politics section and the gym and anatomy <laughs> and it evolved over time. Eventually he started using, no, you know, um, legal pads. And then we said, okay, we have to set you up. So we created a, a spreadsheet, you know, for them um, on the computer. But this was something that they did for over a decade. Uh, and when they got older, even when my mom was ill, Um, and they had nurses in their apartment, they would continue to have these meetings together to decide if something really was an expression, uh, or if so, how it should be categorized. And they would include the nurses in that decision process. Or if I was there, my brothers were there, or their grandkids, they would include us. Um, And it ended up being a lot of serious analysis and conversations and even debates. Um, They did that for 13 years. Um, but the big thing is that from the very beginning, they decided they would not use Google and mm. they would not peek at any existing collections that are out there. So they really were very uh, deliberate and very uh, strict about not Googling to find new expressions. And once they hit 8,000, they started offering their grandkids a dollar for each expression <laughs> they could come up with because they were worried they wouldn't get to 10,000. Um, and then after like three weeks, my dad's like, I'm broke. I'm not doing this anymore. Because my kids are like, ah, I'm going to see how many expressions I could get. But the fact is, it was sort of part of the family fun that we yeah. had, of, you know, we started having lively discussions about expressions. And, and one of the things that would come up were where these expressions are from. Um, so if we could take one minute, John, if you're mm-hmm. game, I was wondering if I can do a quick game with you, one of the many games that's in the book. If I read you an expression and I give you two versions of the origin story of the expression. Oh, right. I, this okay? is my, this is like a dream come true as a person who listens to NPR game shows and has never been on one. So exactly. I absolutely. Okay. Ready? So the expression cold feet, right? Mm-hmm. To have cold feet. I love this picture. It's a cute one. Um, so where do you think it originated? Did cold feet come from one Frostbite of the feet was such a common problem in the 19th century England that mothers would warn against getting cold feet to their children and make sure they put on heavy socks uh, when they, before they left for school. Or is it two, cold feet? It's a military term that referred to warriors with cold feet not being able to rush into battle. Hmm. 
Wait, what was the first part of the second explanation? So the second one, the first one was about moms. Right, 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 right. And the second one was a military term that refer, referred to warriors with cold feet not being able to rush into battle. I'm going to go with two. Yes, you're right. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, one more. Uh, crocodile tears. So is that, and these are illustrations that are in the book, mm -hmm. uh, which are just wonderful. Um, crocodile tears. Is it one, crocodiles actually weep while devouring their prey, which has since been proven to be true by scientists? Or is it two, similar to snake oil, crocodile tears were sold as a health tonic by 19th century peddlers? Oh, I feel pretty confident in myself in saying that it's two. Oh, it's one. No! <laughs> Crocodiles actually, like tears, water, you know, come out of your eyes when they're eating their prey. So. I did not know that. Yeah, I know. I didn't either. And all right, last one. Let's see. You're one for one. So let's see. Tiebreaker. Honeymoon period. Uh, honeymoon period. Is it one? In the fifth century, newlyweds drank an alcoholic drink with honey during their first month of marriage, a moon, one moon cycle to grant them fertility and good luck? Or is it two, Shakespeare originated the phrase honeymoon in the comedy Much Ado About Nothing. Um, and it refers to the good omen of a full moon on the night of a wedding. Uh, I feel ashamed that I should know this as it involves literary matters, but I don't. I'm gonna see if I can solicit the wisdom of crowds. And if you're watching and wanna use the Q and A, <laughs> to tell me one or two, whatever people say most of, I will go with it. I will, I'm going to solicit the audience. I've got one so far. The Q&A is either the bottom of or the top of your screen. So I'll repeat it. Honeymoon period is one, you know, in the fifth century newlyweds drank an alcoholic drink with honey during their first month of marriage, which was the moon cycle to grant them fertility. Or was it two? from Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing, referring to the good omen of a full moon on the night on the night of the wedding. We've got a bunch of stumped uh, attendees <laughs> as well. Um, right now it's tied. Just need one more person to chime in with what they think it is. And that's, that's gonna be the tiebreaker. If not, I'll go for it. Um, Actually, I'm going to go with a viewer who rightly points out that Shakespeare was a great inventor of so many words and phrases. So I'm going to lean on two. Oh, I lost the tote bag. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. It's one. It's that there was this drink they drank. It was called mead. And they, and oh, yeah. So, yeah. And so the one month, the moon cycle, fertility, yeah. Uh, I know these are really tricky. I have to say, I had a lot of fun. That's you know, wild. Um, so anyway, well, you did great. I mean, you really. We had I got one discussion. right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's you could have gotten. I've had a lot of people get none right, which is awkward and kind of defies <laughs> the law of averages or whatever. But um, so okay, well. Um well, uh, that's, I mean, the, the cool thing we got to see too from, from doing this um, and the viewers are seeing as well are these really fun illustrations that are in the book throughout. Um, and can you tell us more about those? And I, I don't know if there's more of them to show too. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, this sort of, I think the two big things of the book are the, like the, um, the categories. So there's oh, yes. Sorry. Are, yeah, no, no, that's okay. No, no, there's 67 categories in the right. book. And then there are 350 illustrations. So the categories, um, I think, are kind of part of my parents' quirky genius in that um, these came out of these discussions and debates and they would categorize. And by the time they were done with 11,000, they came up with 67 categories, which range from animals to colors and numbers to gambling to sports to love, money, royalty, which I just wrote a piece about on medium because there's such a resurgence in interest in royalty, the crown and yeah. um, bridge. What's it called? I just watched it all this weekend. Uh, the 
the Sandra Rhymes one. I can't think of the name. Mm. Of oh, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So anyway, um, so there are all these different categories. And what I love about it is for my parents, it gives you a little insight into who they are. For example, there's the transportation and travel chapter, which obviously has terms like frequent flyer and vacation mode or maiden voyage, all sort of travel related expressions. But my mother was like a super intense packer. Before a trip, she would like two weeks before lay everything out, use tissue paper so it didn't get messed up and really be great about packing. So um, in the travel and transportation chapter, there's a bunch of terms having to do with packing, send them packing, time to pack it up, pack light, carry us excess baggage. Um, and of course the categories differ in size. So the very biggest category is the body chapter, which has 1,039 yeah. expressions. Wow. So, you know, brain cheeser, brain trust, something on the brain, pick someone's brain, left brain, right brain, a no brainer, the brains of the operation. Um, and that's just brain. Then there's, you know, tickle in your throat and live in the public eye, put your foot in your mouth, gut reaction, um, a lot, a lot of expressions. Uh, and then the smallest category has only 25 expressions and that's the category called postal. Um, so you think mm. like, why would you have a category for postal? But my parents, again, were born in 1929 and the post office was important to them and they mailed letters and wrote letters and um, dropped off packages all the time um, at the post office. So some of those are really good expressions though, like seal the deal, to go postal, to push the envelope, mail it in, part and parcel. Um, so, you know, I think probably one of my most favorite things about the book though, is that the way they decided to categorize expressions, they would often do it based on a key word mm -hmm. rather than the literal meaning of the expression, which led to some funny results. For example, in the food chapter, you have obvious ones like baked in the cake, like the cookie crumbles, easy as pie. But you also have ones like to curry favor because curry is a kind of spice. So to curry favor, which is an expression we go in food or mint condition. You might think it goes in automobiles or business, but it goes in food or up in my grill or to hash it out. Um, or there's this chapter called the law so in the law, there's terms like rush to judgment, thick as thieves, good cop, bad cop, but the expression to conduct a sting operation, which is a phrase that conjures up, you know, FBI agents undercover. Um, in, instead of putting to conduct a sting operation into law, they put it into birds, bats, and insects. <laughs> and sting is the predominant word with um, in a sting operation. And when they then paired it with the illustration, one of the illustrations we were talking about, it makes it absolutely clear with the beehive and lots of buzzing, why sting operation belongs in birds fasting. <laughs> so you get the point. Uh, and uh, remember there were 11,000 expressions. So they yeah. did this 11,000 times. They analyzed it that many times. Wow. They had 11,000 debates. So it's fairly remarkable. Um, and one thing I, I feel, which is so unexpected, but I did send the book to language experts and lexicographers right. who are people who complete diction, you know, they compile dictionaries and the feedback I got from them was just, they said it was an astonishing collection. And yes, it's nice for, you know, lay people to read it, but it's an important development for computational linguists because they said it's a terrific resource for natural language processing because it's such a large collection of multi-word expressions. And that apparently is very difficult to collect multi-word expressions on a computer. Um, whereas this, they sat and did it by hand. And so it's, it's sort of a, it furthers the field. So who knew? So their own taxonomy helped further a, a discipline in a way that complicated computer like computer algorithms couldn't. Yes, yes. This is, That's quite cool. You know, it, and it's just so uh, fun to think about and how much joy they got from this and how right. much, you know, fun it is to, for people uh, being told to read it. And they sourced other, um, uh, you know, sources as well, their grandchildren and, and stayed away from the computer in order to do it. So it was all this sort of natural exactly Very expression learning processes time, yeah right like thinking about it and 
And, you know, I think that it also, you know, they were older, but it helped with their minds. You know, they were really with it to the, to, no matter what was going on with their bodies, sometimes they were minds were sharp as tacks and expressive. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, oh, I wanted to get back to the illustration. Yeah, absolutely. Please. Because so, we just landed on a really cool one and they all have this really interesting look to them as, as well. Yeah. So when Simon and Schuster sent my dad and me, my mom had passed away a few years ago mm. and my dad thought he wouldn't work on the book, but then he decided he would do it and dedicates it to my mom. Um, Simon and Schuster sent us some beautiful vintage drawings on the cover. Uh, and it was from the British Library Archive. Mm. So this was the original cover. This isn't what we ended up with, mm -hmm. but um, this British Library Archive, it's good to know about. It has more than a million images in the public domain. So they're all free. So anyone could use them. And we did. Um, and they're really beautiful, yeah. uh, intricate drawings. Um, and my dad though, he was 90 um, uh, when he passed away this past May. But when I showed him this cover, he loved it. Like there were choices, he loved this color, but he said, he's very clear. He's like, I want it to be understandable. So somebody could look at it and guess the expression. So he said, there's an elephant, but the expression is, you know, elephant, elephant in the room. room, but he's like, there's no room. Um, and I promised him that I would make sure to get that done. Um, so, I got to go back to this archive and go through literally thousands and thousands wow. of these beautiful illustrations, which I loved. And we ended up with this cover, um, which you know you can see elephant in a room uh, or feather in your cap. Like it's much easier. And that's so my dad, you know, um, even at age 90, uh, he was so clear that he wanted to be educational and understandable. And, um, you know, so the, the illustrations, like you said, are fun throughout, like the chapter on education, for example. Um, we have one, uh, this one, which is to do the math, yeah. uh, or this one, no easy answers, or the next one, which is too cool for school, which I love this one, because this is from 1898 but it looks so wow. modern. Yeah. <laughs> um, or the chapter on food and cooking. Uh, we have um, to get a piece of the <laughs> pie or I love this next one, a tough nut to crack or this one, which is crazy good back in the soup. <laughs> wow. So they were just all different, either from catalogs or books or um, all from the turn of the century. And if someone's a visual learner um, and you just like, learning through pictures, you can do that. Um, and I think these just add another level of fun to the book. Yeah, and it speaks to, I think as well, the, um, you know, these a lot of these expressions have been with us for a long time. And yeah. so you're sourcing out um, public domain images that m may just happen to fit, but some of them might actually be referring to the expression itself. And, it, and it's a nice connection for us of, you know, the, the long etymological tale for these expressions that we, we That's still use today. Point. That's actually a brilliant point because some of them were literally that. And I was like, oh, that's surprising. Yeah. Um, when you'd see it really was what they meant. And some, you know, like obviously eye for an eye that's been around, you know, for a very, very long right. time. Um, and, um, but it was, it is interesting to see, and it does add to the whole feel, I think, of the handmade kind of very deliberate nature. Right. And it reminds me too of like old, like texts for school children or, or, or those, or like curio books or, or sort of those kinds of like antique bookmaking stuff. And it's just awesome that you were able to access that. that yeah, archive. it was. And I feel like it's such a good resource anybody should you know, if you need anything to go to it, it was just beautiful right. and it was fairly easy to use. And, um, and I felt like they did the book that it makes the book beautiful. It's almost like a coffee table book, you know, and that I just love the feel. Yeah. <laughs> you yes. Know, it feels really nice. And it, it's not quite paperback. It's this flexi bound. So it, it is hearty and will withstand people passing it around. It's ready to go with you to the lake 
uh, and uh, or to the the cabin or something like that as a right. sort of like a non-screen activity. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like it just speaks to that need, and that that was my parents' desire for it. It was to be a catalyst for conversation, intergenerational conversation. My mm -hmm. dad would go crazy when my kids would you know, they'd have a phone and they were like, they're great kids, but every now and then they'd be, he's like, I know you're looking at your phone. I know what that look <laughs> is, you know? And, um, and this was kind of like, let's put that away and we can just talk about this and yeah. meet them and discuss them. Well, one of the um, aspects that's really great about this book, as we've discussed with you quizzing me is how interactive there it is. And there's also this um, page at the end the section at the end, express yourself. Um, and there are dozens of, oh, there it is. There are dozens of fun games that people can play with the book. Um, and as you just mentioned, it's, it's overall just a, a catalyst for conversation. Um, so maybe, I don't know if you can speak a little bit more about, you know, I, it seems to have, you've sort of talked about it, but the, the book has these roots in your family's interactions, in your family history, in your family dynamic. And then, of course, the, the joyous thing that it can do for its readers is is spark those same things, right? For us, um, and I just think it's interesting too that it's it it is not you know as discussed a, a pure. It's not like you go through and you learn all the etymologies of these expressions. Right. It's sort of like a jumping off point for 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 that. And, and so maybe just to to wrap things up to sort of just bring it back to sure. you know just how it ties into to to, to what it seems like was a educational mission of, of your mom and dad. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I mean, this, well, first of all, when they said we're doing this expressions project, we're like, okay, mom and dad, you know, <laughs> we love you, but go ahead. And it felt a little eccentric, but then it became addictive. And I would find my husband, who's a computer scientist up all night. I'm like, what are you doing? What are you working on something? He's like, I have a list of 200 expressions for your dad. I think he doesn't have these. And then my dad would be like, oh, I hate to break the news to David, but uh, we had them all. And so it became like this addiction for all of us. Um, and uh, the great thing about expressions, of course, is they're not just words. They're really reflection of who you are, where you grew up, what period you lived in. Um, and one thing is, you know, sometimes you can get tricked by an expression. Um, so my parents' friend, Diane's mother, who's from Ireland, and her mother would always use the old Irish expression as fast as O'Grady's dog. Uh, and then something was moving or someone was moving too quickly. Like you might say to a kid, don't eat your lunch so quickly. You're eating as fast as O'Grady's dog. So when Diane one day uh, met a childhood friend of her mother's, the friend was talking about, oh, the old neighborhood, it was so great. And there was you know, your mom's house and the O'Grady family who lived next door with this frisky dog who would always like rush out the front door. And Diane suddenly realized, oh, as fast as O'Grady's dog, it wasn't an old Irish expression. <laughs> it was just a neighborhood expression. Um, and meanwhile, Diane moved to New York and taught it to her kids and her kids taught it to their friends. So everyone's talking about as fast as O'Grady's dog. So, you know, the back of the book is to write down those expressions that are family expressions, also ones that they missed because even though they're 11,000, there's some missing. Um, and then I think my parents knew, and maybe the most fun part of the book is uh, they knew that, that they needed something that would tie the book together. Mm -hmm. So they made sure to include two dozen games. Um, and I think, you know, one of the biggest draws of the book I'm being told is that, you know, during these really tough times with COVID and lockdowns and families are all together and we're just sick of Zooming except for tonight, of course, yes. or, but, but like looking at our phones and, you know, bit meetings and the whole thing. So um, this is a way for people to, you know, you could read through the book, you can read it out loud. Some people told me it's like poetry, you open it up and there's just lists and lists and lists of all these expressions. It's kind of, you know, blows your mind a little bit an expression. Um, but also there are games that offer kind of like a roadmap for interesting ways to have fun with the book and with expressions um, and plus the illustrations, right. which definitely lead for fun with guessing games. So do you wanna try another quick guessing game, John? Please, I wanna redeem myself. Okay. <laughs> so this one is 
elephant in the room. Right. So that was, yeah, right. And then let me, let's try the next one. It's a little tricky, but you think mm -hmm. about what she's sitting in. Feel free to help me out in the Q&A, wink, wink. <laughs> the thing she's in, what is that? It's a seashell, a clamshell, a shell. Mm -hmm. and, um, and someone's sort of shy, you know. Oh, uh, clam, clams up, clammed up? <laughs> oh, wow, that's good. <laughs> I never thought of that one. It's the opposite of clammed up. Sorry, it's, I threw you off. If someone's shy, but then they're like, oh, I think I'm going to get a little more confident and. Um, I'm emerging from the shell. Um, yeah. to, come, to come out of my shell. Come out of one's shell. Okay, I see. <laughs> Clammed up is really good. I have to say that. <laughs> um, the next one is a little tricky. This is tough too. Um, where she's looking. Eye on the ball. Yes. Perfect. That's right. Some people think it's a toss up or up in the air, but oh. eye on the ball. She really has her eye on the ball. This next one is, you know, like bikes, they have a second wheel, but third wheel. Correct. Like I kind of want that. I want that bike to be yeah, honest. Yeah, that's cool. I yeah. know. All these things are very much make you want these. Cool. <laughs> and this last one is. Um, I don't, it's, that can't be something easy like hands, hand, a handful or. He's what got books. They? What, They're what? books. He looks like me at the bookstore <laughs> once upon a time. Um, and he's kind of like, you could imagine him almost like trying to, almost like a scale, trying to. I'm, I have, I'm stumped. I'm stumped on this one. <laughs> They're hard. They're, they're, most of them are very hard to sort of, um, if you stand on one foot, you're trying to. Oh, someone says balance the books. Yes, that's it to balance the books, which means, you know, accounting. Right, means, right, right. right. So, and of course, it's not just British expressions that would work. Um, you could look at photographs, and these are my parents, where they're kicking up their heels, oh. and happy as clams. Um, and here they are, very young. They met when they were 16 and 17. Wow. Uh, they were callow youth, diamonds in the rough. And here they are uh, at my mom's 85th birthday, where oh, they wow. were two peas in the pod in their golden years. Um, so the last thing I have, John, is a lightning round of some of my favorite games. Okay. So do you feel up for it? Yeah. Okay. Everybody could chime in too. So yeah, please help me out. I'm going to read a bunch of expressions and you can tell me if it's real or fake. Uh, like the so, expression? Yeah. Like whether it's a real expression or a fake expression. Or fast as O'Grady's dog. Right. Exactly. So these are... Some of them are real and some of them are totally made up. Okay. Okay. Fuzzy as powder in water, real or fake? Um, fake. Correct. That's totally made up. Okay. It's always darkest under the lighthouse, real or fake? That sounds real. You're right. It is real. Um, I guess it's the idea that with a lighthouse, it throws light out into the, you know, far away, but right near the structure of the lighthouse, it's dark. Yeah, um, and maybe like it's good to be there. Like it's not so bad that it's dark because you're casting out the light or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Kind or, of hopeful. Right, or like maybe when you're thinking of a problem and you're just focusing on it near near you, maybe you need to look. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm. Uh, okay, yellow a yellow dog contract, real or fake? Oh, this sounds businessy. So <laughs> I don't, I wouldn't know. So I want to say it's real. You're right. It oh, is wow. real. So a yellow dog contract is interesting that uh, years ago, uh, when um, someone was applying for a job, an employer can say, I'll hire you if you promise not to join a union. So uh, now that's illegal, but that yeah. was called the yellow dog contract. Um, Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know why it was yellow doll. I don't really. Was yeah. supposed to be like a, to sign the contract is to be a coward, or a, oh. it's like, like oh, you could yeah. call it like oh. a scab contract or something like that. That's interesting. I'm not. Yeah, I should know that, but I don't. And the last one is even the smartest cow is illiterate. Real or fake? 
Oh, it sounds real to me. Oh. No, I was I was on a streak. My husband made it up. Even the smartest cow is illiterate. <laughs> it sounds real though. I, it's a good. It's a good expression. Well, the thing about the thing that you, the story you mentioned about fast is the greatest dog. I mean, it just I. It's, it's possible that a lot of these expressions that we have today started as maybe somebody's inside joke or something like that. Right. Um, the way s- slang works as well. I mean, language is obviously super malleable. So, um, yes. So I wonder if your husband's expression will soon become <laughs> and, and right. included in the expanded edition. Right. That's right. Uh, so, okay. This is the last one. So okay. there's another, this is a game that I love also called Malaprop. So, okay, Uh, so is it dog eat dog world or is it doggy dog world? It's dog eat dog. Correct. Is it to hone in or to home in? Is the second, did you say the second one was phone as in telephone? To hone in, H-O-N-E, or to home in, H-O-N-E. It's hone, H-O-N-E, isn't it? It's home in. I know. Really? I know that either. Yes. Yes. That changed my life about a year ago. Yeah. I have to, I have to correct a hundred emails. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, is it last one? Is it to clinch the deal or to cinch the deal? Clinch the deal or cinch the deal? I'm going to go against my instincts and say it's cinch the deal. Oh, no, your instincts were right. Okay. <laughs> That's good. I mean, I <laughs> sort of softballed myself there to be wrong, but right at the same time. Right that up. Yeah, cinch the deal. Um, but on the website, so to speak, book.com, there are more games and uh, we have social medias at, so it's so to speak, book.com and at so to speak book on social media. Um, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them or you can ask me tough things that I don't know because <laughs> I didn't know any of this. I mean, this is all my parents, this book, and I just sort of came in at the 11th hour an expression to kind of, you know, get it through the publishing process. And um, I feel happy my dad knew it was being published by Simon yeah. Schuster and he saw the cover and I printed it out for him and he, he felt the weight of it and yeah. so um i think they are giggling up in heaven together <laughs> i think they really had fun doing this and the reception it's been getting has been really really gratifying it was such a wonderful book and so so thank you for bringing it into the world on your and into the world on your parents behalf and um yeah if, if if you have questions in the audience, please feel free to submit them using the Q&A. We've got a couple so far. Max writes in, my five-year-old son enjoys paging through the book and learning new expressions. Did your parents intend, so to speak, for a, a certain age range of readers? That's a really good question. I think they didn't. They thought that it was really, they were very clear they didn't want it to be a, just a children's book, but of course they love teaching and children. And I think that, they really, um, I'm so glad, thank you, Max, for saying that. Um, there's actually a, one of the categories is children's expressions, like children's limericks, um, and not limericks, but child, you know, expressions related to children's rhymes and, mm-hmm. and everything. And I think that it really is so universal. And in that I've had a lot of people in their 60s and up Say to me, oh, gosh, it brings back such memories. And I yeah. think my mother used to say that. My father used to say that. And one guy's like, yeah, dumb as an ox. My dad used to always say that to me. <laughs> like some are great, you know, but just sort of, it's like triggering memories for people. Right. But little kids are so eager. Like this story started with the, the five-year-olds in kindergarten that ants in your pants. They're like, what? You know, they thought it was gross at first. Like ants, they're ants in our pants. And then thinking about it, it it sort of sparks a whole other part of their brain to think about. So I think, you know, you could read it to children and talk about it as young as five or even preschoolers. Um, And then people your age, John, uh, you know, people in their 20s or 30s, I feel like there's a lot of game playing going on. Um, My daughter is 25 and she does a game night every week. Uh, She and her boyfriend and their friends 
do a Zoom game night, which they started to play this because they're, you know, how many times can you play? They're, they have all different, you know, games that they play. On right. Game, but, and it's, I think it's a resurgence of interest in games that stem from language and appreciation of language. But I'm glad his five-year-old is enjoying it. And there's another question here that this, um, I love, um, and I want to know the answer to as well. Were there any expressions from your parents' grandkids that your parents particularly liked? So once they opened up the floor to to younger generations, they probably sourced up some expressions they weren't expecting. Oh, so many. And so the sort of one that pops to mind is, you know, so for their generation, even my generation a little bit, if you'd say you're gossiping about someone, you'd say, you know, di dish the dirt, like dish the dirt on that right. person. And young people, you, you know, they were told is to spill the tea, which was just a new way of, you know, spill the tea as a term for gossip. But a lot of the, you know, acronyms, LOL, you know, all the, the whole language of being online, mm -hmm. how those expressions and uh, were something my parents didn't know at all and yeah. learned and they were very open to it. That's great. Um, do, do you have a favorite in the whole book of the 11,000 expressions? Oh my goodness. Uh, well, I think about like, I love the expression to burn the candle at both ends. Yeah. Because my mother said that to me all the time when I was younger. She's like, Beth, you're burning the candle at both ends. <laughs> and I looked it up and it turns out it's because it's not just of obviously if you burn the wick at both sides, the candle, you know, it, it gets smaller, but uh, then if you had just one wick burnt, but also since if you burn the candle at both ends, it's horizontal to the ground, the wax falls on the floor, not when it's, when it's vertical, it's not fall, you know, the wax will fall on the candle. So the right. candle lasts a little longer. Right. So burning with the candle at both ends is that both wicks are burning and it's burning exponentially faster. So I was like, oh, that's, that's a good one. And my dad would always say, don't put off tomorrow what you do today. And we had a family expression that he made up. We do what we have to do, not what we want to do. He was a pretty serious, he was a principal, but you know, he had a lot of humor and total kindness. But um, I think those, and I also like the expression, it's a weird one, hunger is the best sauce. Hunger is the best sauce. Um, yeah. Cause, so I started <laughs> cooking. I didn't really cook before. We live in New York. We'd order in and I'm not. And then this pandemic, I've been cooking all the time. And I'm like, when the kids and my husband are hungry, they, it's like, oh, this is so delicious. But yeah, hunger is the super <laughs> hungry. They're less, they praise it less. So I, somebody told me that one. Hunger is the best sauce. That's mostly true <laughs> um one last question for you a question of mine um before you go um in in compiling this book and and helping it reach um you know our hands you know you're an author yourself and you you've you've seen you've had books come out that your work front to back so i'm wondering if if you know what the takeaways were for you um as you re maybe return to books in the future and if there's going to be if you see this being like a series or something that could continue to to um like maybe this there's more books um beyond this one i mean it's such a nice question i think that i mean one thing i'm a personal finance writer and i right. try to bring as much joy as possible to personal finance right. like you know, I was on Sesame Street talking about money with Elmo and, you know, trying to do things that keep it lively and fun. But honestly, the reaction I get on personal finance is so different from this. This right. is joy. <laughs> people are like, oh, I love this expression. And it, it seems like almost people are endlessly excited to talk about it in a happy way. Uh, and so I think I mean, I feel like there's a good game in this. And then yeah. there's a book just with def lots of definitions. I mean, my parents are very deliberate in that they're like, yeah, we could write in all the origins or the definitions, but that's the fun part to discuss and talk about. And then, you know, later, if you want to look something up, I mean, you can Google it in two seconds. 
which sort of, you know, they never used Google to find the expressions, mm -hmm. but when it comes to like learning what they mean or, you know, having that ability. And there often isn't just one definition, you know, there are all these different theories as to where things come from. So I guess my answer is I found this so much fun that I feel like there might be other books that come out of it. Um, or I just leave it as this, you know, yeah. legacy that right. probably more so that and getting back to the books that I, you know, feel a passion for. And, but I think it kind of brought a lot of joy to my life. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Well, thank you. And of course, it's uh, hopefully it will bring, it, it already is, and will continue to bring joy to, to readers' lives. And folks can, of course, purchase it online um, at our bookstore, literatibookstore.com. There's a link in the uh, event page that brought you here. If you're watching this live, of course, you're watching us later on YouTube. There's also a link in the description. Beth Kobliner, thank you so much for joining us tonight on At Home with Literati. And I hope to have you back in the store at some point soon. But we'll be there. Thank and, you so much, John. Yeah, take care. And to all of our viewers, continue to be safe and, and be well. And we'll see you all at the next event. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye.